True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. Wendy Mae Davidson excelled in school and succeeded in her career, but her personal life was always a mess. Wendy had a habit of either choosing the wrong men or sabotaging her relationships, and unfortunately her parents enabled her to be unstable and selfish. After two unplanned pregnancies, Wendy married 24-year-old Air Force officer Michael Severance. Mike was a nice guy, less educated than Wendy, but hardworking and very responsible. And for a while, it seemed like this marriage could work. Then, just one day before they were due to visit Mike's family on the other side of the country, Mike vanished. Join us at the quiet end for the case against Wendy Mae Davidson. It would take months for investigators to locate Mike, but analysis of Wendy's internet searches and GPS tracking of her vehicle would lead to her arrest. So we're in Texas for this crime, and that means a Texas beer. I took a a Houston beer from St. Arnold because I like the name Fancy Lawnmower. How do you like that? Very nice. We joke about lawnmower beers as being uh, low-alcohol, kind of Budweiser-type beers that you drink after you mow the lawn or take a shower or something like that. So this fancy lawnmower beer, I I think that if I lived in Houston, I would drink a lot of this beer. Pretty low alcohol, like 4.5% or so. And it is refreshing. It's just not a very good beer. In my pint glass, the beer is a pale yellow color with a medium-sized white head. There was an aroma that was kind of grassy, outdoorsy, and floral. Taste, not much there. Some sweet malt, kiss of hops, that's about it. It's a nice enough beer. It's kind of innocuous, but not a wild beer, that's for sure. Okay. Well, let's open it and drink it. It is a warm day, so we might enjoy it. (laughs) Well, it's probably as warm as Houston. It's just the humidity is about a zillion points less. Yes, thank goodness. No kidding. All right, so here we are in our quiet home office, recording studio, spare bedroom, whatever you want to call it. It has many titles. Yes, it it does. It works well. Right. We're thinking at some point, maybe in the summer, we'll get back out to the the bar, the quiet end. But right now, here we are. That's right. So why don't you go ahead and start our story today? So Michael Severance grew up in rural Maine. Ah, a Mainer. His father, Leslie, joined the Air Force a few years before Mike was born. Leslie worked as a jet engine mechanic, and that's when he met his wife, Valerie Smith. They were married in 1978. Mike was their first child, and he was born in 1980. Their second son, Frank, was born two years after Mike. As a little kid, Mike was given the nickname Bicycle Mike. Isn't that cute? Well, he loved his bikes. Yeah. Now, he'd begun riding without training wheels when he was a four-year-old, and as a six-year-old, he won third place in a bike race. So he just loved to be outside on his bike. He'd even ride it in winter, which isn't much fun. And those are rough winters up in Maine. Well, you know, it snows. Yep. But he wasn't a troublemaker, and he, he wasn't a mischief maker. He was a nice, quiet, well-behaved kid. Maybe a little bit of a joker, but nothing horrible. Right. So in 1987, the family moved to the small town of Lee, Maine, and the population there is under a 1,000 people. So they were definitely in the country with their nearest neighbors almost a quarter of a mile down the road. Leslie had left the Air Force, and now he was working as a shipper at a paper company. And Valerie took a job as a school bus driver after both of her sons were school-aged. So this let her be home when her sons came home after school, but she could also go out and get out of the house, and earn a little extra money. Always helpful. So the Severance family was never wealthy, but they were quite popular in the town, and they seemed quite happy. 
Their house was often the gathering place for Mike and Frank's friends. Mike and Frank were close as boys, only two years apart, and Frank was the outgoing one, and Mike was actually the more reserved, shy brother. Their mom, Valerie, was very traditional. Her priority was to take care of her husband and her boys, making dinner each night and keeping up on school activities and sports and homework. And even after Valerie was diagnosed with lupus, she kept a pretty hectic schedule. She suffered pain and the side effects of her medications for her condition, but she never stopped caring and working hard for her family. Yeah, lupus is one of those really crappy diseases, and you have all sorts of complications, particularly kidney. Live long enough with lupus, you're probably going to need to be on dialysis or have a kidney transplant or something. High blood pressure, and it's just a shitty disease. Well, and it can really vary. I have a cousin who got it in her early 20s and nearly died. Yeah. But she did recover, and yeah. it can just be a chronic, miserable thing. Yeah, and the medications to treat it aren't a real picnic either. A lot of side effects. So not a, not a fun disease to have. Well, not that any are, but yes, it's miserable. Now, Valerie probably tended to take her responsibilities a little too far in that she didn't always set her own health as a priority. At one point, she had an abscess on the back of her leg, which she ignored until she was unable to walk. And ultimately, she had to be rushed to the hospital to have some emergency surgery, incision and drainage or whatever for the abscess. But she got back to driving the school bus two days after her surgery. Ladies strong. Yeah, I mean, she wasn't going to let any weeds grow under her feet. That's for sure. Now, when Mike was just 14, Valerie had a brain aneurysm. She was oriented when she was rushed to the hospital, but then her condition worsened over the next 24 hours. She ended up being transferred to Boston for medical treatment and surgery, ended up there on life support. So how horrible. I mean, this was their rock, and they're losing her. And this is a young family. So it was definitely a lot for less making that horrible decision to remove her from the machine. And then he was left a widow with two little boys to take care of. Yeah, when he was left to grieve for his dead wife and to raise his sons by himself, he didn't have a clue. Because Valerie had done everything, from the housekeeping to the cooking to managing their finances. So Les was pretty overwhelmed with this. Mike was the oldest. He took over a lot of the responsibilities, and he turned out to be pretty perceptive and task-oriented. And his brother, Frank, seemed to take his lead. So the boys got themselves up in the morning, fixed their breakfast, did the dishes. They did their homework without being asked. Even were able sometimes to cook dinner for their father when he was getting home from work. So and it was a tough thing for the family to do, but the three boys, dad and the sons, managed to get by from day to day. Yeah, so this Mike was actually very sharp. I read a few stories about things he did that were kind of extraordinary when he was a child. And one thing I remember is after Valerie had died, Les had gone to the bank and he took the boys with him and he was doing something with accounts. And Mike was able to tell the bank person all of their social security numbers that he had memorized. Huh. And he was what, 12 or 14? He was young. 14. Yeah, so that's just really impressive. So then about two years after Valerie's death, Leslie did find another woman to love. This was Brenda, Brenda Layton, and she was working as a clerk at a convenience store in Lee. She'd been separated from her husband for about a year and a half, but wasn't really looking for romance. She was busy, and she was still feeling very wounded by her husband who had cheated on her. So Les began stopping by the store and chatting with Brenda, and they talked about his two boys and his late wife. Brenda also shared stories about her two daughters, and after a few weeks, Les got up the nerve to ask her out for a cup of coffee. So they took their time, but they did make the decision to bring their two households together. So it's kind of like a mini Brady Bunch situation. Sort of. Yeah. So Brenda and her two daughters, 10-year-old Brooke and 13-year-old Nicole, moved in with Les and 15-year-old Mike and 13-year-old Frank. Fortunately, these kids all got along and the boys didn't resent Brenda. Brenda was pretty smart and 
thoughtful. She kept photos of Valerie in the house, and she even encouraged the boys to share memories of their mother. So that must have been kind of generous and difficult for her to do, but she did it. She realized that their mother was important and she needed to help maintain her memory. So Mike and Nicole were fairly close in age and they became pretty good friends. They had a lot of common interests. Mike helped Nicole make friends in the neighborhood and he would even take her with him when he went to sporting games and other activities. Nicole was athletic, Mike was too, and they did a lot of running together to keep in shape. Mike also was a skier, and he ran track. And in his senior year of high school, he made it to the state finals in cross country. Frank played basketball, and they had friends at the house often playing at their driveway basketball hoop. So their lives certainly changed after Brenda and her daughters moved in, but it seems that the changes were pretty positive. I think in a lot of ways they absolutely were. Les and Brenda didn't actually get married, but they were a family in every other way. They celebrated holidays together, and Thanksgiving was a big event at the house. They would fill the house with family members and friends and cook a big turkey together and bake pies. So Brenda's daughters, Nicole and Brooke, would spend Christmas with their dad, and then the blended family would celebrate on Christmas morning together. Les and Brenda's ex-husband actually got along which really helped everyone to schedule holiday celebrations without any fighting or arguments. They actually worked at the same paper mill, and they'd always been friendly, so there was really no problem there, which is nice. Yeah, it's nice to hear about that sometimes. You know? Yeah, it's rare, you, right? You always get the impression that it's just horrible when you try to mix families together. This worked pretty well. Yeah. So after Mike finished high school... He told his father that he wanted to be a cross-country trucker. Now, Les thought that was probably an okay job, but he encouraged Mike to see a bit of the world first. Les had been in the Air Force, so he suggested that Mike join up. Mike agreed, and he began active duty in September of 1998. He was stationed at Dias Air Force Base in Abilene, Texas. So it was there in Texas when Mike met his first serious girlfriend, and her name was Hillary. He really bonded with her family, but he wasn't ready to have a commitment with her. So after a few months, they broke up, but Mike did maintain a friendly relationship with her family. Then in 2000, Mike made a good friend named Shane, and he liked him so much that he decided he someday wanted to name his first son Shane. Well, that's really nice. Yeah. So he was deployed to the Middle East five separate times. Yikes. And in between, he was part of the aircraft maintenance squadron. So his dad was super proud. I bet. And for fun, he was still Bicycle Mike at heart. He loved to race ATVs. And through racing, he made many of his friends. He was good at it, but he wasn't one to brag. And he was always helping the other racers. So Mike was a man of few words, but also he seemed like a man with a really big heart. Now, Mike's brother, Frank moved to Abilene in 2002 to live with Mike. And then one time when Mike was on a tour in Afghanistan, Frank was in a bad motorcycle accident. He recovered uneventfully, but didn't want to ride anymore. Mike encouraged Frank to get back on his bike, and he helped him overcome his fears of riding again. In December of 2003, Mike went out with some friends for a couple of beers, and he met Wendy Davidson. Mike was 23, Wendy was 25. That same night that they met, Wendy took Mike home with her, and they had sex. So Mike had no idea what he was getting himself into here, right? He thinks he's just having a hookup. It was. It was a one-night stand, right? Yeah, but Wendy was a troubled person. Although she was very intelligent and really an exceptional student, she just lacked common sense and made poor life choices. And this would be noticed, not only in her personal life, but when it came to her professional life once she became a veterinarian. And I think that many of Wendy's problems could be traced back to her mother. Her mother, Judy Elliott, grew up near San Angelo, Texas, and married Wendy's father, Lloyd Davidson, in 1974. And this couple saved their money and built a house on a ranch. They had Wendy May in 1978, and then in 1979, her brother Marshall Anthony was born. 
So Judy worked as a secretary until she was diagnosed with lupus. So huh. that's a little coincidence there. Jeez, what's the probability of that, huh? I know. And then she was on disability. So when Wendy and Marshall were young, Lloyd worked for Levi Strauss. And this was a family who pretty much kept to themselves, except they would spend holidays away with Judy's parents. Lloyd built an outdoor aviary where he raised and sold parakeets, pigeons, and cockatiels. And their house was always filled with pets. Wendy actually got her first dog when she was still a preschooler. And she liked to rescue wildlife out on the ranch. She once raised a baby raccoon whose mother had been killed by a passing car. So by the time Wendy was in high school, she decided that she wanted to spend her life working with animals. And she was the golden child, really, so Judy and Lloyd were super supportive, maybe a bit too supportive as time went on. They volunteered at school, and they felt that their daughter could do no wrong. So the problem was that in Judy's mind, no man would ever be good enough for Wendy. Yeah, so Wendy was a straight-A student. Schoolwork came pretty easy to her. She was also a cheerleader, and she played on the basketball team and the volleyball team, and then even found some time to perform in some uh, theater presentations. All this stuff helped her create a pretty impressive college application. As well as Wendy did academically, she was, to put it nicely, socially challenged. She wasn't popular and just didn't seem able to relate with her peers. Many of the girls at her school had a negative opinion of Wendy. Even on the cheerleading squad, she didn't have any friends. So she's not your typical popular outgoing cheerleader. She sure isn't. She did it more for the college application. And the only boy Wendy dated in high school was more of a friend than a boyfriend. Wendy was very focused on her goal of becoming a veterinarian. And at graduation, she was very disappointed not to be the valedictorian. But she was the salutatorian. In her high school yearbook, Judy and Lloyd purchased a space where they praised Wendy and told her how proud of her they were. So that was really nice. That was. And in 1996... Wendy began taking classes at Angelo State University, which was close by, and she continued to live at home. She worked at a local vet clinic over the summer, and she had a serious boyfriend. And his name was Shane, coincidentally Another again. Another coincidence. Marshall also worked for a vet during the summers. His name was Dr. Terrell Sheen. Sheen owned a lot of rental property in town. Marshall did maintenance jobs for him. He also worked on Sheen's personal property, the 7777 Ranch, which was in nearby Grape Creek. Now, Marshall couldn't live up to Wendy's academic accomplishments in school, but he did well enough. And his aspiration was to become a law enforcement officer. He was a member of his high school's National Forensic League. Yes, I wonder what they did in that group. Yeah, crime scene investigation. Yeah. <laughs> But then in 1998, Lloyd lost his job with Levi Strauss, and Marshall introduced his dad to Terrell Sheen, and he urged Lloyd to become a self-employed contractor. So once Lloyd began, he worked almost exclusively for Sheen on his properties. So it was kind of weird, this guy Terrell Sheen, because he kind of had the whole family under his thumb, which I found kind of strange. I mean, it's a small town, so maybe that's the way it worked, but he has pretty much everyone doing his bidding from that family, and they really looked up to him. Yeah, they thought he was pretty special. Well, he did a lot for them. Yes, he did. So by the time Marshall began taking classes at Angelo State, Wendy had already moved on to vet school, so she had managed to complete her prerequisite courses in just two years as an undergrad and she was accepted to the College of Veterinary Medicine at Texas A&M. So this is extraordinary. Get through undergrad in two years? Boy, I guess. And get into Texas A&M Veterinary School, which is one of the big ones. So it is impressive. And she did meet the difficult demands of the program. And in the summers, guess who she worked for? Terrell Sheen at his vet clinic. I was just going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> So in her fourth year of vet school, Wendy was required to complete 30 weeks of hands-on basic veterinary care, plus 12 weeks of small and 12 weeks of large animals. 
and this is done to help students decide on the type of practice that they would like to do after graduation. And Wendy really liked the idea of large animals, but it was a lot rougher to get into that, a lot more expensive to set up a practice and everything. So she never really did get into that. She stuck with small animals primarily. She did manage to do some socializing while at A&M. She had several sexual relationships. She became pregnant at least once and had an abortion. After being with other students, Wendy ended up in a relationship with a guy named Ryan. And when he tried to break up with her, she told him that she was pregnant with his baby. And this kind of became her M.O. So this pregnancy was the second pregnancy? That we know of. Okay. So, and Ryan didn't believe Wendy at first that she was pregnant. But the pregnancy was confirmed by a doctor. Then Ryan's parents met with Wendy's parents to discuss what they should do. Ryan's parents agreed with Ryan that he should support the child, but he wasn't going to marry Wendy. Now, this pissed Judy off, so she and Wendy decided that Ryan's not going to have anything more to do with Wendy or the baby. So this is Judy in a nutshell, right? Yeah. It's her so way or the highway. Sounds like. And everything is, you know, should be how Wendy wants it. And instead of having Wendy take responsibility for maybe using birth control or something, it was really just all about what the guy was going to do for Wendy. And there was certainly nothing proving that Ryan was the father. In fact, Wendy had three possible fathers for this baby. <laughs> Jeez. She contacted... She gets around. She did. And she contacted this guy named Jason Burdeen, who she'd slept with a few times, and told him that she was pregnant and he was the father. So Jason told her that he wanted the baby, but nothing to do with her. So things aren't going the way she wants. Boy, I guess. In October 2001, Wendy's son was born. She named him Tristan. And Judy moved to the college and cared for Tristan while Wendy completed school. So Judy's all about Wendy. And a DNA test was done, and Ryan was actually eliminated as Tristan's father. Wendy called him to tell him that, but oddly, she invited him to come and see the baby anyway. And he never did. He was just happy he was out of it, really. Yes, he'd been banished. Now, the problem with this uh, DNA testing was that Wendy would give different results to the three men. <laughs> doesn't work real well, does it? So Jason read a report that eliminated him as the father, but years later, Judy Davidson claimed that Jason was Tristan's father. Now, that's not Wendy, that's Judy. I'm not sure how she knows. Well, she was right in her business. And Wendy swore that she didn't know who the father actually was. So what a mess. Total. But the thing is, through all this, Wendy did finish school and did great. And she moved with Tristan to Abilene after she graduated. Her brother Marshall graduated with a degree in animal science and wildlife management, and he took a job as a park ranger about 300 miles away. Wendy was hired as a veterinarian at the Abilene Animal Hospital. And just one week after she began work, she hooked up with the 18-year-old son of another veterinarian on staff. So she hung out with this guy for a week or so, and then began talking about a long-term relationship with him. And this freaked him out. He just graduated from high school. So after two weeks, he stopped seeing her and he didn't answer her calls. Next, Wendy dated a brother of one of her co-workers and this lasted for a few weeks. When he started to back away, Wendy told him she was pregnant. Then she ended up telling him she had a miscarriage. So we don't know if she really was pregnant or Yikes. she was using that to keep him. I can't imagine this makes her very popular at the animal hospital. No, it didn't. And I just think there's definitely something psychologically wrong with her. Because this is a habit of either getting pregnant or saying she's pregnant, of clinging on to men. Obviously, she had some really serious issues. It's so it would seem. I mean, here, here she is. She's a graduate of veterinary school. So she's mid-20s, 23, 24, 25. Yeah, younger than most because she did get through quickly. And she's talking to an 18-year-old new graduate from high school about a life together. Yeah. That's just... So she was really, really kind of desperate. Yeah, something's going on. She also had this habit 
of taking home animals that were scheduled to be euthanized at the vet clinic. She preached to co-workers and clients about euthanasia, and she would lie to them if necessary. The senior vet, Dr. Ellis, had a hard time directing Wendy, who always thought she knew best, even though he had like 20 years of experience. So that's a problem. Now, Wendy had a nine-month relationship with a guy named Jeremy Gonzalez. After he lost his job, Wendy said she broke up with him. But the people who knew Wendy and Jeremy would say that the actual reason for the breakup was the pressure put on Wendy from her parents. Because Gonzalez, as you might imagine, is a Hispanic, and Judy and Lloyd disapproved of their daughter Wendy dating a Hispanic man. Yeah, so they're not only weird and overbearing, they're racist. Now we can add racist to the list. Yeah, but then Wendy got pregnant again. This was with a guy named Joel. Judy and Lloyd met with Joel's parents to plan a wedding, even though Wendy was well into her 20s. But Judy complained that Joel just wasn't good enough for Wendy. She called Joel lazy. Soon, Wendy called off the wedding and had another abortion. Judy and Wendy told the story of how Joel had come to their house and just begged Wendy to take him back. But according to Wendy's brother Marshall, it was actually Wendy who was crying and begging Joel to take her back. So just some serious issues in relationships. That's a mess. That's what I said. It's a mess. A real yeah. mess. Now, Wendy took a chihuahua home from the clinic after Dr. Ellis had told her to euthanize the dog. Now, the dog had a broken leg that wouldn't heal, and it was clearly in a lot of pain. Wendy we, we kept the dog in her bathtub at her house because the dog had a large amount of pus draining from his leg wound. Ew. Now, eventually, the infection did heal, and Wendy gave the dog away to a friend. The dog eventually needed to have his leg amputated, but he did survive. So... I can certainly see that sometimes someone might come in to have their dog euthanized and the dog's fine or can be easily treated, and I can see the temptation there. But it seems like this dog did a lot of suffering, so I don't know if that was really the ethical thing to do, even though I'm sure it's unethical to lie to the owner and say you have put the dog to sleep as well. You would think? Yeah. I mean, I totally understand it's a rough thing to do. I couldn't do it. I would never be a vet because I could not do it. But once you are a vet, you need to be able to do that. Well, it's part of the job. Right. So I guess you could say she saved that dog, but the dog had to go through a hell of a lot. And she was just taking risks in her career because she thought she knew better than anyone else. Another example is when a sick litter of kittens were brought into the clinic. And they had a very contagious fungal infection which could be easily transmitted to other dogs, cats, and even people. So if they kept these kittens at the clinic, the spores would live in the bedding and other equipment for months, so it was a threat to the health of all the animals. The kittens were isolated from the other animals by Dr. Ellis until he confirmed the diagnosis and made a decision along with the owner that the kittens should be put to sleep. And Wendy was told to euthanize them. But she said they were just so cute she couldn't do it. So she took the kittens home, even though this is a real health risk because remember, she's got like a three-year-old son at home at this point. So Wendy treated the kittens at her home, and when she thought they were all cured, she returned them to the clinic one at a time. Yeah, but she was wrong. The kittens were still contagious. So they ended up infecting a lot of the other cats at the clinic. And in the end, 28 cats had to be euthanized, and this included the kittens. So for this little mishap, Wendy was fired from the clinic. So she's just started out really as a vet, and she's very unprofessional. It's not going well. That's an understatement. Yeah, which is all psychological because she certainly had the intelligence to perform the job. But, you know, no common sense, poor ethics, just poor choices. So she moved on. She moved to Lubbock, and she got a job with Dr. Gary Sveed. And she convinced him that the incident with the cats was Dr. Ellis's fault, not hers. It was around this time in her life when she met Mike Severance at a bar and brought him home. And then a month after that, she found out that she was pregnant. Mike, Mike, Mike. Obviously, he wasn't wearing a condom. Well, I don't know. I mean, it can happen. 
Sure. But she certainly could have said she was on the pill. Who knows? Yeah, well, she called Mike and told him she was pregnant, which uh, kind of shocking to him. It was just a one-night stand. Now, Mike didn't feel ready to settle down, but he decided the worst thing that could happen was a divorce if he married Wendy and helped her raise the child. So he, he felt that marrying her would be the right thing to do. So that's an interesting concept. I'll marry her and I'll raise the child and maybe down the road we'll get divorced, but the baby will have a couple parents for some time. Yeah, I guess he discussed this with his father and they thought, well, you might as well try living with her. You like her. She's having your baby. Maybe it'll work out. Worst thing that can happen is a divorce, but we know that the worst thing wasn't a divorce. No. So after Mike proposed, Wendy took him to meet her parents, and that must have been just a thrill for him. I'm sure that went well. And Judy instantly disliked him, of course. Then when she found out that Wendy was pregnant, she was really angry. But she blamed Mike, not Wendy. And she felt that Mike was unworthy of her daughter, and Wendy could definitely do better. So I guess you can tell by now that Judy was not shy about telling Wendy her opinions. And she began calling Mike rude, disrespectful, and lazy. On a regular basis, she said these things. And this was similar to what she had said about Wendy's previous boyfriends. Yeah, I don't think Wendy's dated anybody yet who's passed muster with the big Judy. Right. So the wedding date was set for September. Wendy, before the wedding, decided to open her own veterinary practice in San Angelo so she could be close to her parents. Now, that's an expensive proposition, but her parents helped, and Terrell Sheen also helped with some financial assistance. Lloyd and Judy invested over $40,000 for renovations and equipment, and Sheen rented her the building for her clinic at a greatly reduced rent. There's also an apartment attached to the clinic, and that's where Wendy, Mike, and the children would live. Because remember, she's got a boy, Tristan, from a previous relationship, and she's pregnant again Right. with Mike. Mm -hmm. So in August, as renovations were being made, Mike and Wendy moved in with Judy and Lloyd. And this had to be really miserable. Mike commuted over 90 miles to the Air Force Base each day, and Judy's hatred of Mike only grew. She started telling Wendy every single day that Mike was rude and lazy. So this living situation was tough to say the least, and the Davidsons were not at all respectful of this young couple's privacy. So on September 1st, Shane was born, and Judy was more resentful about this than happy, and she called the baby that little bastard. And that's a really awful thing. I can't imagine a grandmother doing that. What a nice grandma. I'm, I'm <laughs> noticing that nice. also that Mike kept his word that his firstborn son was going to be Shane. Yeah, he did. That's, that's pretty nice. So it's good that she didn't argue with him about that. Yes, for sure. So Wendy, Mike, Tristan, and Shane moved into the little one-bedroom apartment at the clinic. Mike's dad, Leslie, came from Maine to see his new grandson. And then on September 13th, Mike and Wendy were married. Now, Les arrived a few days before the wedding, and he spent time with Mike and Shane. He babysat Tristan and Shane so that the couple could go out and have some time alone. Tristan loved Mike, and he was already calling him Daddy. Les was proud of his son, and he really wanted to get to know Wendy better, because it seemed like Mike was in for the long haul here. It did, and I mean, of course, Tristan really never knew a dad. No, he didn't. And Mike really devoted himself and put a lot into it, which I think is something he should have done, absolutely, but not everybody would. But when Les first met Judy and Lloyd Davidson, let's just say they were not very friendly. He was told by one of Lloyd's construction workers that the Davidsons were angry at Mike for marrying their daughter. The wedding was small and simple, and afterwards there was a celebratory dinner, but Judy and Lloyd didn't show up. And after Les returned home to Maine, he told family members that Wendy seemed like a nice young lady, but her parents were just ignorant and cold. He was really concerned that Wendy's parents' negativity could hurt Mike's relationship with Wendy. Yeah, and their married life wasn't ideal right from the very start. They had a newborn and a four-year-old living in a cramped one-bedroom apartment. 
They didn't have a kitchen. They had a sink, a toaster oven, and a microwave. And in order to go to the bathroom, they had to go out the back door and in through the kennel of the clinic. The dogs were bathed in the same tub that the family used. Yeah, so yuck, huh? Doesn't sound ideal. No, I'd be looking to get out of that place quickly. But Wendy was really busy starting up her own practice. And Mike was a loving dad to the boys. But he had a long commute, and he often had to work the night shift. So fortunately, Tristan often spent the night with his grandparents, Judy and Lloyd. But of course, Wendy was stressed. She's just 26 years old at this point. She has a newborn, and she's opening her own new business. So she and Mike bickered a lot, and Judy was always there to take Wendy's side and make things worse. The clinic opened up to the public in October. It had a very convenient location, and they advertised and brought in a lot of new clients. Judy also spent her days at the clinic volunteering as a receptionist, often having Tristan there with her. Family operation. So Judy expected Mike to help with the new clinic, conveniently ignoring the fact that he had his own job. Even after he had worked a night shift, driven 90 miles home, Judy expected him to work in the clinic. So if he did go home and go to bed, she'd call him lazy and no good. If he drank a beer or two, Judy was very quick to tell her daughter that she thought Mike was an alcoholic. So nothing's really going well here. This doesn't sound like any fun situation. Actually, it sounds like my first marriage. (laughs) Doing this podcast every week, I pretty much live and breathe true crime. So when I need to lighten the mood and have kind of a mental palate cleanser, my go-to refresher is the game Best Fiends. Best Fiends is fun. It's a unique puzzle-solving game, and you can play it anywhere, anytime. They also have monthly updates with new levels, and you don't have to use your cell phone data or Wi-Fi to play either. For me, this is a way to check out but keep my brain engaged at the same time. And kind of like true crime, Best Fiends has a story that makes me think, but it doesn't have the bloodshed and legal twists and turns. But one of the best times for me to play Best Fiends is when I want to be with my husband, but he's watching sports. Now, I'm not a sports person, but I can still cuddle up on the couch and spend time with you, Dick, while not being bored out of my mind. Although now with the pandemic, not many sports out there. So that's good, too. Yeah, how much sports have I watched in the last couple of Not much months? lately, no. <laughs> no. But you do have your guy shows. I do. I like Best Fiends, too. But the time I like to play it is when you're watching one of your zombie movies or any of those things on Lifetime. (laughs) To me, it's a casual game that anyone can play because it's easy to follow, which is crucial for me. You can play for a couple minutes or a couple hours because the game will pause and automatically hold your place. Win-win. Yeah, the Best Fiends characters are bugs and their antagonists are slugs. This is a five-star rated game that's as challenging as you want to make it. Engage your brain with the fun puzzles and collect the cute characters. With over 100 million downloads, it's become very popular and a must-play. Download Best Fiends free in the Apple App Store or in Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Mike and Wendy planned a trip to Maine to see his family on January 16th, 2005. They purchased plane tickets and were scheduled to fly into Bangor. Mike went to an Air Force leadership course on December 29th, expecting Wendy to pack and prepare for the upcoming trip. Yeah, because he's going to be away for a couple of weeks for this course. So it's up to Wendy to do stuff. Well, that's what she said, I guess. But, yeah. you know, since they'd always lived in Texas, Wendy and the kids didn't have any winter clothing to go to northern Maine. But Wendy didn't go shopping or do any packing, and she didn't buy winter coats or boots or gloves or anything. So that makes us wonder, was she really planning on making the trip at all? Well, she's certainly dragging her feet. I'd say more than that. So Mike got back from his course on January 12th, and he was pretty excited to be going home to see his family. And he certainly couldn't wait for the family to meet Tristan and Shane. He was excited to take Tristan sledding and has shown snow for the first time in Tristan's life. 
Yeah, he really liked that kid and was thinking that he would adopt him and they'd, you know, be a real family. So Mike called his dad after he returned to Texas and told him that he was worried about his marriage. He said that Wendy was cold and distant since he got back from his course, and she really didn't seem happy to see him at all. Well, during Mike's absence, Judy and Lloyd had apparently been relentless in poisoning Wendy's mind against Mike, and they really didn't want her to make the trip to Maine. So on January 13th, Mike helped out at the clinic all morning. But Wendy was super critical as if he just couldn't do anything right. So Mike took Shane and went to visit friends in Abilene. He returned back about 4.30 in the afternoon. Then Judy came and picked up both boys to spend the night at her house. But Wendy and Judy were really pissed off that he'd left with the baby. So Judy returned the next day, which was Friday, with both of the boys. And Wendy had a really busy day at the clinic. Mike made arrangements to have his truck repaired that Saturday morning, so he called his insurance company and set up a car rental for their time in Maine. Friday night, Judy kept Tristan, and Wendy's friend Jamie babysat Shane. Wendy and Mike went out to dinner at Buffalo Wild Wings, which was right across the street, and after dinner, they went out dancing and drinking. So what happened that night after Wendy and Mike returned to the clinic is really not known, only Wendy knows for sure. But the Texas State Police were able to reconstruct a likely scenario, and we'll go over that now. So once they got back to the apartment, Wendy gave Mike a beer that was spiked with five phenobarbital tablets. Phenobarb's a pretty soluble drug, and the beer would easily mask the bitter taste. This wasn't a fatal dose, but it would certainly be enough to make Mike unconscious for several hours. So boom, he's on the bed, gone, sound asleep. And once Wendy was confident that he was unconscious, she injected him with a syringe full of buthanasia D. This is a veterinary euthanizing solution. It had a lethal dose of pentobarbital and phenytoin, which is a seizure medicine. But it's sedating. It can sedate. Yeah. This shut down Mike's respiratory system and his heart. So this is so cold-blooded to do this to him. It's just crazy. It's terrible. Yeah, and you know, I mean, other than her parents bad-mouthing him, it it seems like this was all of a sudden. I mean, I know they fought and stuff like that, but this seems really extreme. Yeah, and that's the thing about this case is no one's really sure what the motive was here, other than maybe he was going to leave her. But it, it does seem extreme. It doesn't seem to match the situation. But it certainly seems like she wasn't preparing to go on that trip. No. So that makes me think it was premeditated. Well, yeah, the euthanizing solution was available anyway because they lived at the clinic. It just seems extreme. Oh, it is extreme. It's very extreme. I mean, hell yeah, it's extreme. You can't get much more extreme than killing someone like that. Well, you know, you go out for dinner, then you go dancing and have a few drinks afterwards, come back and get killed. I know, right? Jeez. And this is someone who didn't want to euthanize pets? Yeah, <laughs> I can euthanize husbands. You know, and just weird. Puzzling, really. But next, of course, Wendy had to get rid of Mike's dead body. So what she did was she backed the pickup to the back door and dragged his body into the truck bed. At the correct angle and with the gate open, she'd be able to get the truck bed to just about two feet off the ground, and this way it was easy to hoist Mike into the back of the pickup. Wendy was short, but she was kind of stocky. She was strong. And Mike wasn't that big. He was, I think, 160 pounds. So Wendy covered Mike's body and shut the tailgate. Then she retrieved an old brake drum and a concrete block from the shed behind the clinic. She also took some baling wire and fishing line with her. Then Wendy drove the truck out to the 7777 ranch until she got to the main gate, and she had a key, so she was able to open the gate and drive right in and she shut the gate behind her. So the drive was now down a one-lane dirt road, and there was a large pond about a mile in, and that was known in that part of Texas as a stock tank. And this one had a boat dock on one end, and it was stocked up with fish in the summer for fishing. So Wendy drove up to the dock, dragged Mike's body onto a wooden platform built over that end of the pond. Then she used baling wire and fishing line to attach the brake drum and cinder block to his neck and legs. 
And this is a guy that she just had a baby with who was not abusive. So I don't get it. I mean, the motive here is really difficult to grasp. Mike was only 24 years old and he was caring for the children and they were planning a future together. But now he was a corpse wearing just his boxer shorts and she was getting rid of him like a piece of trash. She pushed Mike into the water and watched him sink. Then she drove Mike's truck out of the ranch and back to the apartment at her clinic. And she went to bed for a few hours until Judy arrived in the morning to open the clinic. And I guess she thought at this point that she'd gotten away with murder. Yeah, so far so good, right? I guess. So Judy got to the clinic somewhere between 7.15 and 7.30 that Saturday. Wendy drove to Jamie's house to pick up baby Shane, and she was back in time to open the clinic at 8 a.m. So Judy asked Wendy if Mike was coming out of the apartment to help out at the clinic. Wendy told her, nah, he's too hungover from last night. To Judy, Wendy seemed to be in a pretty good mood. Then around 10 o'clock, Lloyd arrived with Tristan. He did some work on the outside of the clinic. Lloyd noticed that Mike's truck was parked out there, the truck that was supposed to have been dropped off at the body shop that morning. So the clinic was open until 3, but Judy and Tristan were tired, so they went home around noon for lunch and a nap. And when Lloyd finished his project, he went back to the house to be with Judy and Tristan. Wendy stayed and closed the clinic at 3. Then she put Shane into his car seat in Mike's truck. She arrived at her parents' house a few minutes after 4. They all ate dinner together, and Judy continued to complain about this planned trip to Maine. She was really upset that they'd spent $1,500 on plane tickets, and she told Wendy it was a bad idea to leave her new business for a week. She also wondered aloud if Mike would allow Wendy and the boys to return to Texas once they got there. Mom, she's doing everything she can to sabotage us. I think she needs her own life to worry about. She's way too involved. Way too. So Wendy visited her grandmother and then returned to her apartment. And then she claimed later that this was when she discovered Mike's body. Yeah, but after dumping Mike's body, Wendy had called and canceled their flights to Maine. Then at 5 a.m. on Sunday, she called Les Severance at his home, and Brenda answered. Wendy asked her if she'd seen Michael, and this was really confusing because Mike and Wendy were supposed to be flying up to Maine that same day. But Wendy said she couldn't find Mike. He didn't come home the night before, she said. And Brenda said, well, Mike would never miss a trip home. She asked if Wendy was ready to leave for the airport when Mike showed up, but Wendy said no, she hadn't even packed. So Brenda's confused. She doesn't understand this. And the flight was just two hours away. And why hadn't Wendy packed? And where was Mike? Now at this point he was on leave from the Air Force and she wondered, well, maybe he had been called in for a national emergency of some sort. But other than that, she could see no way that he would have missed his flight. So Brenda called her daughter, Nicole, who was close to Mike. Then she called the airport. Brenda learned that the tickets for the flight had been canceled that morning. So this filled her with dread, and she spent the next several hours on the phone looking for Mike. No one had seen him. And everybody's confused by Wendy's kind of casual attitude. Yeah, everybody else is kind of panicking and freaking out, and she's like, well, no big deal. Yeah, you know. So after Les got home and heard what was going on, he called Wendy. She told Les as she drove Mike's truck to her parents' house with the kids, and she hadn't heard from him. Les knew that Mike had planned to take the truck in for repairs Saturday morning, and Wendy said they had forgotten to do that. Now, Les knew that wasn't true, because Mike loved that truck, and he wasn't ever going to forget an appointment. So Les knew that something bad, or at least something not good, had happened. Well, after talking to Les, Wendy went with her dad to the police station to file a missing persons report and she was told that an investigator would come to her house the following morning. She then called the Air Force and reported that Mike was missing from home. So the clinic was scheduled to be closed all that week for the main trip, but Wendy opened it up on Monday morning and worked. Detective Dennis McGuire showed up at the clinic to talk to Wendy and her family about where Mike could be, and Wendy said that Mike had been acting weird for the last few weeks. She said he'd been drinking a lot and hanging out at the local bar. He'd been disappearing for hours, she said, without telling her where he was going. 
and she said that Mike was gone when she got home Saturday night. That was about 8 p.m. So Wendy told the detective that Mike was on leave until January 24th, and she also told them about their planned trip to Maine. She said there was $200 missing from the cash register at the clinic, and she believed that Mike had taken that money. All of Mike's clothing was still in the apartment, and his pickup was parked outside, and then it was really scary because his cell phone and wallet were inside the truck cab. So there's no way he left willingly without that. That's for sure. So Les then called Mike's commanding officer at the Air Force Base, and he said he'd look into it. And then he called Les back in about 15 minutes. He said that this was not characteristic of Mike, and he's going to investigate and find out what's going on. Then on Tuesday, January 18th, Wendy went to a lawyer. She filed a petition for divorce. She requested that Mike provide health insurance for Shane and that he pay child support. Wendy wanted community property divided, and she wanted to keep her own property. Then she filed a restraining order. This order forbid Mike from contacting her, from using obscene language, and from threatening her. She claimed that she was in fear of Mike, that he could cause bodily harm to her or the kids. So this is a sick woman. I mean, doesn't that make you think there's really something wrong with her? So the interesting thing to me is here we're saying that she's keeping up the pretense she doesn't know where he is. And she just goes in to talk to a lawyer and files for divorce. Yeah, and how did she think that that wouldn't be looked upon as strange? I guess she thought no one would check. I have no idea. So Air Force special agents came to Wendy's apartment the next day, Wednesday. And they verified that Mike was not there and had not taken his military or other clothing from the home. Wendy told them that Mike had been talking about not wanting to go on his next deployment, and that he had talked about disappearing into Canada. Now to them, Wendy seemed emotionless and apathetic. Usually when someone went AWOL, they were found within a couple of days, and this case was not at all typical. So Mike's case was referred to the San Angelo Major Crimes Task Force, And since Mike had not reported for duty, now there was a serious violation, which made this a criminal case. A search showed that Mike had not rented a car in Texas, and he hadn't boarded a train, a plane, or a bus. A search of computer searches and cell phone records was approved, and Sprint was served a subpoena on January 25th. Judy Davidson was interviewed, and she claimed that Mike really hated the military. She said that he had talked about going to Canada, and Lloyd said the same thing. But it was really only Lloyd and Judy and Wendy who said this. Lloyd mentioned, though, Terrell Sheen's property, the ranch, and said that Mike had access to it, so maybe he was out hiding there. So Wendy and Lloyd took lie detector tests. The results were inconclusive. Wendy's attorney linked to the media that Wendy had passed the test. Now, of course, we know that polygraphs aren't foolproof. Anxious, innocent people can fail. Sociopaths can lie and pass. The accuracy of polygraphs has been reported to be anywhere between 50 and 75 percent. We also found out that Wendy had logged onto her computer and researched how to pass a lie detector test. (laughs) She also searched on the decomposition of dead bodies in water. So not subtle. After doing some research, she learned that Mike's body would eventually rise to the surface of the pond. So she decided she's going to have to return to the body and fix things before she was found out. So we know that a corpse usually sinks in water because the specific gravity of a body is close to that of water. When submerged tissue begins to decompose and the bacteria create gaseous byproducts, So the gas that accumulates in the body decreases the specific gravity, and it becomes buoyant. So you might weigh the body down, but that only delays the body in rising. It will eventually come up. Now in cold water like that at the pond, the body would begin to be floating again within a couple weeks. Yeah, so it was February 27th when she learned about the buoyancy of dead bodies, so it had been a while. So she went to the shed behind the clinic and got anything that weighed a lot that she could attach to Mike's body. 
and then she planned she'd get more stuff when she was out at the ranch. So she left the clinic in Mike's pickup, and she brought along her boning knife that she'd used in vet school. She drove out to the 7777 ranch and scavenged for more heavy items. Then she drove back down to that stock tank, and from the dock she could see the shape of Mike's body that was just a couple of feet below the surface, so it had been rising. So she got into a little boat that was attached to the dock there and went over to Mike's body and pushed it to the opposite shore. Then she got right down in the mud with the body. So this whole thing is in some ways almost worse than the murder itself. This is really gross. Yeah, this part, this is just horrible. She stabbed Mike in his chest and abdomen, basically ripped his torso open. And then she rolled him over and stabbed his back several times. So I guess she's figuring she's releasing all the gases. Then after stabbing his body over 40 times, she attached more weights to it and watched until it had fully submerged and she couldn't see it. So this is just so cold. I mean, the murder was super cold. And this is just like a crazy person that could go out and do this. This shows no respect or love of him as a human being at all. None whatsoever. Just treating him like nothing. It's horrible. And you have to wonder, with these stabs, was she getting out some anger at him, too? Was it all just to let the gases out, or was there some anger? Because that's a lot of stabs. Well, 40 times, probably some anger involved. So that makes me think maybe he told her he was going to leave her. You know, she'd been left by a lot of guys, and maybe she just kind of lost it. We won't know, will we? No. No, because she's a real psycho. The day before, which was February 26th, police had put a tracking device on Wendy's vehicles. The data from the tracking devices showed she had traveled to the ranch on the 27th. So the agents talked to Terrell Sheen on March 1st, and he gave consent to a search of his property. So on March 3rd, Sheen showed a group of agents around the property, and they searched all the buildings. They were also shown all the ponds, including the large pond, which had a boat and Mike's body but they didn't see Mike. No, on March 5th, Wendy was interviewed by the Texas Rangers, and they asked her about the Sheen property and about those computer searches. And she became kind of short and defensive in her answers when she heard that. She ended the interview after a call came in with an animal emergency to her clinic. And the agents excused her to go do that, but asked her not to leave the clinic because they still had stuff to talk to her about. And they had agents that were surveilling her vehicles. So after leaving the interview, Wendy fled the clinic and drove out to the ranch. And the agents that were watching her followed her. And they arrived at the ranch just as she was opening up the gate. So she was kind of caught red-handed there. Here, she says, you got to excuse me. I have to attend to this emergency. Right. They said, sure, don't leave the clinic. We have more questions to ask. And the first thing she does is rabbit away from the clinic. So they're, they're in pursuit of her. And here we are at the ranch. Well, and my question is, what was she planning on doing? Good point. And he's weighed down with all this stuff. It's not like she could just pull him up and take him somewhere. I don't know what she was going to do. But they told her she couldn't enter because this was uh, property that was secured and that was being searched. And of course, at this point, they're really concerned that Mike is in the pond. Why else would she go out there? So she argued and got quite upset, but then she did leave. So back at Judy and Lloyd's house, Marshall was having dinner with the parents when Wendy called the house. And Wendy told Judy that someone was following her and she was going to drive to the cemetery. So Marshall grabbed his gun and drove the two miles to the cemetery, where he saw Wendy standing at their grandfather's grave. Her red Camaro was parked nearby, and Wendy was super agitated, pacing in a circle. And there was no one else there in sight. So Marshall asked her who was following her. And Wendy admitted that no one was following her, she just had something to say. But she wanted Judy and Lloyd to come to the cemetery before she told him. But Marshall pushed Wendy to tell him what the hell's going on here. And she said, I didn't kill Mike, but I did find him dead. So this was quite shocking. Her brother didn't think she had anything to do with this. And it's not a believable story either. 
What's the story on how she found them dead? Well, Marsh... How, how does she explain fishing them out of the pond? Because that's what's going to happen eventually. Well, she hasn't thought that far ahead. Apparently not. But Marshall asked her why she would dispose of his body if she found him dead, and she just started crying like she was the real victim. But she said she'd freaked out when she found him, and she thought that someone from her family must have killed him. So to protect her family, she felt like she needed to hide his body. So it's one of the lamest stories I've ever heard. And also, at first, Wendy actually brought up her dying grandmother as the possible killer. And Marshall knew that that was totally ridiculous. This is someone who had dementia and was living in a nursing home. So Wendy just said that no one in the family liked Mike, so she thought that one of them had killed him, and she disposed of Mike's body to protect them. Ah, okay. And even to Marshall, this sounded like bullshit. So Lloyd and Judy arrived at the cemetery with Tristan in a car seat in their car, and then Shane, who was just four months old, began to cry from the back seat of Wendy's Camaro. Marshall told Wendy to keep her mouth shut, and then he called Detective McGuire. And when he got a hold of him, he asked him to come out to the cemetery right away. And when McGuire arrived, Marshall told him that they needed to search the pond. He told him that Wendy said she had moved the body, but she had not killed Mike. He said that Mike's body was in the pond. So I'm a little surprised that Marshall right away called the detective, but he was in law enforcement and he really thought that that was the right thing to do. I guess that'd be the answer, yeah. And it's all going to be found out anyway. They're out at the pond. Right. So Wendy's going to be taken to the police station for questioning. And as they're leaving, Marshall said, get a lawyer. At first, Wendy was pretty angry with Marshall, and she went on and on about her her innocence and her loyalty to her family. She got charged with third-degree felony for tampering with evidence because she had transported Mike's body and concealed it, and there's evidence on that body. That's what they came up with the holder for a while anyway. Then a dive team searched the pond, and they recovered Mike's body. They detached a cinder block, tire rim, a brake drum, and a boat anchor from his body. He had stab wounds, and he wore only his boxer shorts. And he was still recognizable because the water temperature is about 50 degrees. Yeah, so after the body was recovered, the police and Texas Rangers got warrants for Wendy's clinic, her home, her computer, and her vehicle, and then she was arrested for murder. As investigators looked more into Wendy, they learned that she stood to get about $500,000 in insurance benefits upon her husband's death. Uh huh. So that could be a motive. Certainly could. Then, back in Maine, Mike's family was visited by three Air Force officers in uniform, so they knew that this was the worst news. They didn't want to answer the door. Their families gathered around Les and Brenda as they mourned for Mike, and the family was up all night crying and talking. Of course, things only got worse when they learned that Mike had been murdered by his wife. I can only imagine. So while in jail, Wendy's calls to her brother and her parents really focused on just her and her children. Wendy just seemed to have an excuse for everything, and she was always the victim. She wanted to make sure that Shane would get Mike's death benefit. That was high up on her priorities. But her primary focus was always Wendy. And she didn't seem capable of taking any responsibility for her actions. She just blamed other people for the situation she was in. And in her mind, everyone should have been focused on her. She really showed no empathy for Mike or his family. She also complained about the GPS trackers that had been put on her vehicle. She said it wasn't fair and the police were out to get her. She didn't seem to accept reality, really. I mean, she wanted to get out of jail and go to Mike's funeral in Maine. Can you imagine how that would have gone over? So when she wasn't allowed, she sent Les flowers and wrote him this letter saying that once this was all settled, she'd really like to continue being a family and spend time with him in Maine. So it was just weird. And Les was really shocked by this. She was really acting as if she'd like run a red light or something. She was not taking it all seriously. So Judy and Lloyd filed a petition to get custody of Shane. Les would come to visit him, and he eventually got shared custody. As the autopsy results were pending, Wendy was able to get out on bail. 
Now, while she was out on bail, Wendy gets arrested for child endangerment. She had left Tristan alone asleep in the clinic apartment when she went to shop at Walmart. So Tristan was found across the busy street riding his four-wheel bike around the Buffalo Wild Wings parking lot. And did I say he was four years old? I know. How terrifying, huh? So, after this incident, Wendy was only allowed supervised visits with her children. However, she continued to make excuses and blame other people. Well, yeah, I mean, in some of her conversations with her mother, she was like, oh, you know, I've been under so much stress and he was asleep, I thought I could just run out for five minutes. But we know she was gone a lot more than five minutes, even though that wouldn't even have been okay. Right. But this little kid got on his little bike and went across a busy road and was crying and riding around a parking lot. Yeah. Anything could have happened to him. So after that, many of Wendy's clients and colleagues stopped supporting her, and she lost most of her clients. And a toxicology analysis from Mike's autopsy showed high levels of pentobarbital and phenobarbital in his gastric contents and body tissues. And when the clinic was searched, these drugs were found. The narcotics log showed that Wendy had put a dog to sleep on the day Mike disappeared. But when the police contacted the dog's owner, they learned that the dog had been treated and sent home. So they figured out that the method used to murder Mike was the euthanasia medicine from Wendy's clinic. Yeah, so a grand jury met in May, and the homicide indictment read that Wendy had intentionally and knowingly caused Mike's death by introducing toxic levels of substances into his body. Wendy then had to surrender herself to the county sheriff's office where she was booked. Her trial for Mike Severance's murder began in October of 2006, and Wendy's only valid defense would be if she could prove that the military rules of evidence were violated by the placement of trackers on her vehicles. So when this fell through, the defense team decided that Wendy would have to plead no contest. If she went on trial, she was facing up to 99 years in prison, and a no contest plea allowed her to not admit guilt and maybe get a shorter sentence. So both sides agreed to forego a jury trial and submit the case to a judge. And the judge decided that she would be considered guilty, and she was sentenced to 25 years for the murder and 10 years on two tampering charges. So she'd be eligible for parole in 13 years, but that was not bloody likely that she'd get out. She was transferred from the jail to the prison in January of 2007, and her license to practice veterinary medicine was revoked. Now, what's funny to me, not funny haha, but funny strange, was that the possibility was open that she could reapply to get licensed again after her release from prison. (laughs) Which just, I can't see that ever happening. While she's been in prison, Wendy continued to write to Les Severance, and she would still not take any responsibility for Mike's death. Her appeals for a new trial were denied in 2008. Yeah, and her appeals were mainly about the trackers. That was the main argument but it was determined that that was a legitimate thing to do. So as far as Shane goes, the custody was shared between Judy and Lloyd and Les. And if she was eligible for parole in 13 years, that'd be 2019, 2020. Yeah, she's not out. So she's not out. No, we did see an interview with her, a short one, on a Snapped episode that was on oxygen and just a real fruit loop, I have to say smiley and still really defending herself and making excuses. Really just not a likable person, let's just say that. Very unlikable. Also, if you look her up online, you can see that she's in a prisoner pen pal site. And if you want to read the blurb she wrote, holy shit, just, you know, things aren't quite as fun here as they were at Texas A&M, but I would love to chat. And she has a picture of herself like in a halter top and shorts leaning against her red Camaro obviously from pre-prison time. So just a real weirdo. And not a nice weirdo either. (laughs) Okay. So our sources came from the Texas Court of Appeals, from a book titled A Poisoned Passion by Diane Fanning, and also from the Snapped episode I just mentioned, and that's Season 27, Episode 9. TCB's music was written and produced by Tristan Capel. So as far as little housekeeping details around here, 
I just want to remind everybody that you can get an extra episode every month, plus you can get every weekly episode with no ads now by joining Tie Grabber and supporting the podcast. And what you do there is you just sign up. There are different ways you can do it. You get a free gift and then you can listen to the podcast on your podcast app or on the website with no ads and an extra episode. So I think it's been really popular putting out the regular episodes with a no ad version for the members. Also, we have a shop on our website if you want to buy t-shirts or cups or anything. And you just go to tigrabber.com and click on the shop button. Try it. It's fun. (laughs) Also, you can leave us a review. That's very helpful if you do that on iTunes or wherever you listen to our podcast. That really helps us bring new people into the fold. So what do we have for feedback today, Dick? I have some emails. And if someone wanted to send us some feedback, where would they send it? They would send it to truecrimebrewery at tiegrabber.com, and we'll get it. Yep, or you can even leave us a voicemail on our website by clicking on send a voicemail. That works too. Yep. So the first case suggestion is from Karina. Now, Karina's from Denmark, and she writes... Some nice laudatory stuff, which I edited out. Thank you. And and she says, and now for the case suggestion. (laughs) So Peter London was born three years after me, about five miles from where I grew up in a small town south of Copenhagen. Peter and his family, mother, father, and little sister, moved to Florida when he was nine years old and then relocated to Maggie Valley, North Carolina. Well, I have to tell you, we really... We don't really do mass murders, school shootings, or serial killers in Denmark. And because of that, the case of Peter London still gets high attention there in our country. He's one of the rarest types of convicted mass murderers we have due to the killing of four people. So, as you can imagine, things didn't go so well for the Danish family in the land of opportunities. Peter and his father were convicted of the torture, killing, and disposal of the body of his mother, in 1993 in Dare County. Peter was sentenced to serve 20 years and his father was served two years and they were both to be deported to Denmark after serving time. So there were shortages of prison cells in America's prison system. Big surprise. So Peter was released after serving nine years of the 20 years of his sentence. He was extradited in 1999. So he gets off the plane, he's a full-blown psychopath, scoring scaringly high on the test for this disorder, so they didn't take any chances on the flight overseas. There were four officers on the plane escorting him. In Copenhagen, two Danish policemen received Peter from the four U.S. officers. They escorted him outside the airport, uncuffed him, and let him go. What? Really? But he served his sentence, so there wasn't any reason. Because that surprised me, too, and I did a little research and found out that, according to the law, when he served his nine years, he had fulfilled his sentence. Okay, but then he reoffended. Okay. So, a few years later, Peter London could add his girlfriend to his resume, and he killed her two children also. So, this guy killed his mother, his girlfriend, and her two kids. Now, even though the police never found the bodies... They found enough DNA evidence on the cutting board from both of the boys to convict him for their deaths. I don't even know why we're talking about a cutting board, but that's ominous. Well, it might be simple enough that it was a regular cutting board that he used to cut up bodies. Well, that's pretty bad. Yeah, right. that's the kind of thing I thought would be bad. <laughs> You're right. Okay. So it sounds pretty interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of material on that case, I guess. There is. I'm going to be looking at it because it'd be nice to do a Danish case. Karina also gave us a beer to review with. She said it's very popular in Denmark, although she says to her it tastes like shit. Did she send you some? No. Okay, so we need to get it. We'll figure out how to get it. Okay. Okay. All right, thanks, Karina. That does sound fascinating. And our next case suggestion is from Jen Kidd. And Jen wrote that she really liked her free gifts that she got for becoming a tie grabber and that she likes the podcast and Yada, 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 and thank you very much. And then she goes on to suggest Jack the Ripper and H.H. Holmes. 
She says, I believe his great grandson has researched his movements and is convinced that he was actually Jack the Ripper. I think there was a Netflix special on it and it's really fascinating. I was more than willing to leave a voicemail, but I couldn't figure out how to do it. I hope that the both of you are happy and safe and I look forward to many more episodes. So leaving a voicemail is actually really easy, but if you don't visit the website, then of course you wouldn't know how to do it. And I think that's what a lot of people don't visit the website. So just for everybody else to know, because we do love to get voicemails, go to tiegrabber.com and there's a little orange tab on the right side that says send a voicemail. And it's really as easy as that. You click on that, make sure your microphone is working on your device and leave us a voicemail. We really appreciate that. Before we get to this one more case suggestion, I know we've talked about doing a Jack the Ripper episode, and there's a suggestion by a relative of H.H. Holmes, who was a serial killer in the U.S., that this guy Holmes was actually Jack the Ripper. We want to look into that. All right, on to Carrie. All right, so the case suggestion is from Carrie, and Carrie writes, your true crime podcast is my favorite. And she gives us some more compliments. Thank you, Carrie. And her case suggestion, she says, is something that happened in a small town, Hanford, California. An 11-year-old girl named Tracy Renee Conrad's body was found in a kiln of a neighbor's house a month after her disappearance. So it turns out the killer was her friend's dad. She'd gone over there to play that day, but the boys were not home. Thank you for your consideration. So... Yes, I've heard of this case. It's a haunting case and definitely something I would be interested in looking into. Definitely is. I was intrigued. The killer was just an ordinary dad till this little girl went over. I don't know what triggered him to kill her, but he did. And we think this was his only victim? Don't know. That certainly is scary. I thought so. Yeah. So we'll look for that. Yeah. That's funny because when I was a little girl, my friends used to be afraid of my dad. <laughs> Uh-oh. Well, yeah, it turned out he was okay. He never did anything. Oh, good. (laughs) But I think he just liked to kind of tease them, and, you know, people were afraid of him. But that's my weird family anyway. Never mind. Okay. Okay. All right, so that's it for today, Dickie. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next week at The Quiet End. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye.